Uh, hello all and welcome to the Rails board meeting. Today is Friday, April 26, 2024. I'm Alex Fancina, president of the Rails board and I call this meeting to order at 1 p.m. Emily, would you please call roll? Sure. Monica Caldicott here. Lizzie Camargo. Jean Carroll here. Alice Creason here. Gwen Gregory here. Diane Hollister here. Jennifer Hovanek here. Renee Leva here. Julie Milibeck. Thomas Stagg. Here. Alex Vancina. Here. Vanessa Villarreal. Karen Voidick. Here. Yolande Wilburn. Here. And Katherine Yanikowski. Here. We have a quorum. Thanks, Emily. We'll handle guests and public comments at the same time, starting here in Burr Ridge. Monica Harris, Rails. Sharon Swanson, Rails. Layla Heath, Rails. Jody Rubel, Rails. No Philippeck. Are there any public comments here in Burr Ridge? If not, we'll move on to East Peoria. Are there any guests in East Peoria? Uh, Anthony Deso from uh, RSA. Anthony, any public comments? None here. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Emily, would you read the name of any guests on Zoom? We have Karen Egan from the State Library. And hey. Kate Meehow also here for Rails. Thank you. Any public comments from Zoom participants? Hearing none, Emily, did we receive any by email? Thank you. All right, that brings us to the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to move any item to the regular agenda for further discussion? If not, may I have a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. A second. Yolande, thank you. Uh, Emily, would you please call roll? Monica Caldicott. Yes. Jean Carroll. Yes. Alice Creason. Yes. Gwen Gregory. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Jennifer Hovanek. Yes. Renee Leva. Yes. Thomas Stagg. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Ulan Wilburn. Yes. Kathy Yanikowski. Yes. And Alex Mancina. Yes. All right, next we have Sharon with the Rails Financial Report. Alex, and hello everyone, yet again. Um, so I just wanted to review um, our cash and investment balance. Um, we have approximately 20, $25.1 million, um, which would cover 22 months of budgeted fiscal year 2024 operations. Um, and I have good news, April 22nd, um, Rails received the LSTA federal portion of our APC grant, which is the remainder of our grant. It's um, just a little over $1.9 million. Um, so the federal government did approve um, the LSTA funding, the state library received it, and the controller processed it um, extremely quickly because I checked on Thursday and it was not out there in vouchers. So they must have done it overnight. Um, which is great news. Um, this is the fourth year in a row that Rails has received the entire APC grant um, either before May or within the month of May in the same year that the grant funds were awarded to us. So um, we've had very stable funding and very stable cash flows. Um, general fund revenues through March um, were nearly $14.9 million. Um, this is approximately $628,000 above budget. Um, this is primarily due to investment income. Um, everyone knows that the Federal Reserve, to, Reserve has been holding rates steady. Um, we're currently averaging 5.5%, um, which is um, a very, very slight increase from February because the Federal Reserve has um, expressed in their very last meeting that they had um, that their intention is not to lower interest rates until July at the earliest. And we are still expecting the three quarter of a percentage point cuts between July and December of the same year. But um, their overall tar long-term target rate is 2.6%, which they don't plan on um, reaching until 2027. So these cuts are expected to happen extremely gradually. Um, and this pattern of cuts um, and gradual decrease in rates has been factored into the fiscal year 2025 budget that's currently under development. Um, and the, these over budget revenues are also affected by the, the accounting for um, our new lease of our Rockford facility. So according to um, the new GASB rules that came out a couple of years ago, um, 
because we're signing a long-term lease, essentially we're purchasing the right to use the that asset, that building for a certain period of time. So the way it needs to be recorded now is um, capitalized as an asset and depreciated over the term of the lease. So the present value of the payments of the lease for the entire term of the lease are recorded in um, the capital outlay account and they are recorded both um, they're recorded as lease proceeds and then they're offset by capital outlays and expenses. So it's a zero net effect, but it does show us those two separate line items and the financials. Um, so it doesn't affect our overall bottom, bottom line. Um, general fund expenditures through March were um, over a little over $11.9 million and were nearly $532,000 below budget. This is mostly due to lower library material, materials expenditures. Um, this, this is just timing differences between budgeted and actual group purchases expenditures for BrainFuse, Creative Bug, Communico, and press reader subscriptions, um, as well as just the normal, de the normal delay in um, timing delay in receiving and paying our e-content um, vendor for our e-read Illinois program as well. Um, and this is also due to lower contractual services expenditures. It's normal timing differences for our delivery outsourcing contractor, as well as um, budgeting the fuel surcharge that they, that they charge us at a $4.25 rate for fuel. And we've been averaging well below that. So um, we're, we are going to be very favorable to budget in that area. Um, these lower contractual services are also due to um, not yet having expended any of the My, Li My Library Is grants, uh, but Rails has recently awarded a total of $104,204 to um, 28 member libraries. This is um, a little over $4,000 above the $100,000 that was budgeted, but this was due to um, two school libraries which tied in the scoring process. Um, and of course we couldn't choose between them and this is money to support our members, so we funded them in full. Um, and we can absorb it with other, other expenditures that are below budget in that, cat in that cost category. Um, we also have not yet awarded the remaining um, cataloging membership grants. Um, the grant period closed this last week, early this last week. Um, we received, from what I can see, one applicant um, and we should be well under um, what was budgeted because we usually try to estimate the maximum number of requests that we, that we may get. Um, we did have also have lower vehicle expenditures. Again, the fuel prices, because we budgeted at $4.25 per gallon, we've been running between $3.64 and $2.74. Um, and that's the tax-free rate, of course, because we do get the tax exemption. Um, and rails for the fiscal year 2025 budget is projecting to keep um, that $4.25 per gallon rate in place just to account for the potential for full-blown war in the Middle East and how that may affect fuel prices, just in case we felt that it was safer. Um, and of course, we are running over budget um, with our vehicle repairs, but on April 16th, Rails did receive two of the um, five box trucks that we ordered. So this should help with next year's expenditures in this area. So uh, we are up to a total of nine vehicles out of the um, so far, and we expect to receive the um, last four, hopefully between now and the end of the fiscal year or by early next fiscal year. So we shall see. Um, so during the month of March, Rails did pay for the remaining minor peripheral equipment cost for the Burr Ridge recabling project. This was $280. It was, it was, they were small items, as well as those two box trucks that I just mentioned, totaling $119,460. Um, and that was just about all that I had for everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Right. All good news. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to reports. Uh, I have no report this month and the committee reports were included in the board packet. Are there any questions or additions to those reports? Uh, this is Tom. Uh, I have a report. Uh, I have a report for the nominating committee. 
Uh, the nominating committee will meet on April 30th to review the nominations for the fiscal year 2025 election. The nominating period ran from March 20th to April 19th. The Rails communication team sent notifications to the regional email lists, social media accounts, and L2 contacts. The nominating committee did a great job of recruitment with personal recommendations as well. The Rails promo video featured Jean Carroll, Gwen Gregory, Jennifer Havonic, Renee Leva, Vanessa Vill Villarreal, and myself, and edited by Ola Gronsky was a great recruitment tool suggested by the nominating committee. We have received 10, 10 nominations for the two open at-large seats and seven nominations for the three open public library trustee seats. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. It's a record. <laughs> <laughs> By good mark. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, so that brings us to uh, the Rails. Monica. Thank you, Alex, and good afternoon to you all. Um, before uh, we get into the meat of the report, I just wanted to take the opportunity to recognize um, our newest Rails team member. This is Jessica. Um, Jessica, if you can wave to everybody. Um, she just began in her new role as the Rails member engagement specialist on April 3rd. Um, we're so glad to have her. Jessica, is there anything you want to say to the group? We're so pleased to have Jessica. She has an amazing background um, in Texas libraries, as well as school libraries and academic libraries. So she really brings some really interesting facets to our Rails team, and we're really thrilled to have her. And she's really hit the ground running. Um, so we know you'll be hearing more from Jessica. Um, I wanted to give you just a brief update in terms of the Illinois legislative updates that you received in your packet. Um, there has been an update to House Bill 4567. That is the bill that amended the criminal code to include library employees as protected in relation to threats and disorderly conduct. So as some of you may um, have heard in the meeting uh, with Secretary Janulius on April 22nd, uh, after the third reading of this bill on April 19th, it was... Uh, the sponsor pulled the bill from the record, which means that it is not currently moving forward. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that as well. Um, we are continuing to watch all Illinois legislative updates, of course, and we expect that there will be an update on all these items at the Illinois Library Association's Public Policy Committee meeting in early May. Uh, I wanted to address um, something that's not in the report because it's something that just happened this week, but I know many of you may have heard about concerns from Illinois public libraries around accessibility um, and in particular complaints that may be received by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights in relation to accessibility in the web and on mobile apps in public libraries. Um, we have been in conversation with the Illinois State Library, with the Illinois Library Association, and with our sister system um, in Heartland to talk about potential avenues to support libraries dependent on how this expands and potentially moves to other libraries in the state of Illinois. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of updates on that. Now keep in mind that this has just come up this week. The first time that we heard about it was actually at the uh, session that we had with Secretary Janulius um, on Tuesday. But following that meeting, uh, the library director who noted their concern in the chat at that meeting sent a really great uh, email to myself, to Cindy at ILA, and to Greg McCormick at the Illinois State Library just to explain a little bit more about the situation and what was happening. Um, so for anybody who, who may not be familiar, um, Title II, uh, which concerns a lot of the rules around web accessibility um, that is relevant to all levels of government, including local government, the rules were actually just updated this week for some changes that are expected um, for libraries and many other types of, of agencies that are happening soon. So there will be a lot to note and learn. Um, we did put accessibility on the May 8th Rails member update. So we will have a whole section on that, which will include some discussion and understanding of how those Title II rules are changing and what uh, the on-ramp, you know, to discuss that and how people might address some of these changes. Um, we are looking at potential uh, 
let's see, group purchases through a Rails deals and discounts program for vendors who do look at accessibility modules. We will continue to discuss what those might look like and who those vendors might be, but please know that those discussions are currently in progress and we will update you as soon as we can. Um, our continuing education department is also continuing to look at additional potential avenues for CE, both about how to respond to requests that might come from the U.S. Department of Education, as well as accessibility in general and other changes. Many of you may remember accessibility is, of course, part of our strategic plan under goal two, which is on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. So this is well within the realm of what we would want to prioritize and what the, has been set by the membership and the board. So we do want to be able to react to this as quickly as possible. Um, you will also be seeing some budgetary requests in the final budget that you'll see in May that are related to Rails access to accessibility. Our website was just designed um, not long ago with accessibility in mind. Um, Brian here at Rails has always done an incredible job at keeping us on the forefront of making sure that our materials are accessible as possible. But as these changes come, there will be more things for us to need to respond to. And there are sometimes things with our vendors and third party vendors. So uh, Layla has done a really amazing job with our VPAT process. Some of you may have seen that discussion that was on the director's list on how our vendors use accessibility. And so we are going through and updating some of that information as well with current information. Um, and so we are definitely going to be expecting to hear more on that. Um, we've also been in touch with Ansel Glink and the Lyra insurance pool. Um, you may remember that Lyra is an insurance pool that covers many libraries. And so we wanted to ask them about their relationships with accessibility um, with their K through 12 uh, contacts that they have, who have also spent a lot of time looking at this issue. And so it will be on the agenda at the May meeting of Lyra for the leadership as well to see what responsive uh, activities they can do in relation to accessibility. So obviously we'll be talking about this a lot more at the May 8th uh, member update in many capacity, but I wanted to share that with you because I know you may be hearing from colleagues who want to know about Rails response. Um, so that's what we have so far. I did also meet yesterday uh, with Leslie at, from Heartland and also Cindy from ILA to discuss all of our organization's individual responses. We expect to speak more with the Illinois State Library, who I know is also looking at this issue, especially after the discussion with Secretary Janulius. And so we expect to hear more about uh, the avenues that they are looking at around this soon as well. Um, so any questions about that piece before we look at the rest of the report? Yeah, Renee. We were actually having a discussion on the same subject prior to the meeting. I think it's one of those things that, you know, this is, will definitely impact a lot of the special rural, you know, school libraries, essentially the ones that have tight budgets. So I think if we can most definitely have those free services, I think one of the tools that I even mentioned on the director's list was like Andy, which is a governmental tool that's free. It's a basic tool that anyone can use uh, to at least have like something to, to work on uh, instead of having to purchase something expensive, a package of full rails can figure out some type of incentive. The other thing too that rails could help too would be if because i'm currently doing this at this moment if we're switching website vendors because a lot of again the smaller libraries usually go for those mom and pop shops and they don't they don't really focus on the accessibility part they just focus on to hey this just looks nice and fancy look at that image go um if we can if we can just have like a simple questionnaire if you're switching vendors or if you're getting a third party vendor, what kind of questions should you be asking? Because at the end of the day, the $250 widget you're going to put in your website might only cost you that for an entire year. But if the state's going to go after you because it's not accessible, then it's one of those things where is the fine going to be bigger than just $250? You don't know the process. I know Jen mentioned like some of the things might take two years. You'll have a two year limit to get to the changes. But then you just, it's one of those, like, you just don't want to think about that. You rather just get it done. So if Rails can somehow create some type of form of like, how do you make sure those widgets or the website, or even for in dance case with marketing, that the marketing that you're coming out with that's posted on your website is actually accessible for everyone. So I, I there's a lot of questions, but I feel like if we can just get something uh, for all all libraries, and that can at least assist all of them to at least get a basic understanding, and then they can do their due diligence and reach out to those companies. 
But these are great suggestions, Renee, and I think uh, it is mostly going to hit the, our smallest rural libraries the hardest, um, especially if they haven't been looking at some of these things for a while, um, that there may be a lot of changes potentially to have to make. But I do think all of our members need to be really aware of this. Um, one thing I didn't mention that we are also uh, working towards is a Pulse page that would be focused specifically on accessibility so that we can kind of put all the resources that we have and that are created and recommended to us by our partners in one place so people who are looking at this issue can kind of find it all together thank you for that our school district was cited by uh, uh u.s department of education two years ago for inaccessible website and it at the time i think it, it hit us all but i think in the time between then and now it has become it fast becomes part of your mindset right um you know I, I i can't do that way or i have i have to include these words um and and we completely changed our website vendor to a vendor who could say like it's going to be like there, there there's there's no there's no help but it be accessible if you use our platform um so it is it, it is a mindset change but it is doable um and i think that i um i often um, will will have that in my mind now where it wasn't so much before. So I think that's such a good point, Monica, because I think the important thing to remember is although in the immediate aftermath, people are concerned about making sure that they're following the rules and figuring out how to be compliant. But ultimately, this is a great thing because it yeah. makes our websites and information accessible to everyone. Um, so I think we can all get behind the reasons that these things are very important. It's just a learning curve of figuring out how we get there. Well, on, on whatever Pulse page there is, I'm sure I will ask, uh, our IT department has done great work in um, how to's and suggesting um, checking tools along the way. So I will be happy to, I'll ask permission and then I'll, I'll be happy to share all the, the good things that have helped me and my coworkers. Great, thank you, Monica. I would just add that, yes, it is a good thing. I think we all wanna get there um, and, uh, you know, we are making those changes because we recognize our website's not accessible, right? And so we want to make sure we're doing that. I think one of the other things that I think Rails could be of real support on are the third-party vendors. Yes. Because they're linked on our pages. And so we're then also responsible for yes. ensuring that their content is accessible. And so that's where I think Rails can really play a tremendous role in working, making sure yes. that the vendors that we all are using are compliant as well. So thank you very much for this. Of course, and we've been talking about that as well. So that's definitely on our mind, but I think that we do have a role to play in that arena. Any other questions about that piece? I do wanna thank you all for your attention to that. And I know that this has generated a lot of conversation this week. So I appreciate the opportunity to update you about that. Um, of course, there are other things in our reels. Uh, report for this month. I especially wanted to call your attention to some of the things that we're working on in terms of support for school libraries on Public Act 103-100. Um, it's related to an FAQ that we are in the process of creating. All of the potential questions have come together. I want to thank our partners at the Illinois Heartland Library Association who are now taking those questions and doing a first draft of answering them, and then we're going to come back together um, and see how we can help, but we really appreciate their work on that. Uh, we also have a May 3rd meeting with a lot of the members of the partnership to discuss the development of talking points around having a certified school librarian in every school. Um, these would be with the audience of library partners, so people from other types of libraries who want to support their local school libraries, the talking points they could potentially use in contacting their schools, and then one for community members, so how community members could respond to the important need for um, a, a certified school librarian in every school, and we are planning to use some of the slate data, of course, in order to support some of those things. So uh, stay tuned, but we're really excited with some of the progress that's happening. And that is, again, through this partnership group that has been so fruitful in terms of the work that has happened. And we're so grateful uh, for our relationships with those partners. Um, I did want you to know we did have a meeting um, on April 25th uh, with uh, some of the leadership at Heartland Library System about the joint board meeting that we're hoping to have in fall 2024. Um, you all, thank you very much for responding to the survey that went out about potential dates for fall. Um, we are still trying to get 
a critical mass of responses on those dates to make sure that we're not planning a date that isn't going to work. Um, so we will be sending out another communication just to let people know that we really need to hear from them. I can tell you from the original dates that were proposed, November 13th is not going to work. So we know that one is going to be eliminated. So we're looking at some dates in October and we will keep you posted as soon as we can um, about how to update that. Um, finally, I wanted to thank Secretary Janulius for the opportunity uh, for Rails members to meet with him directly and to ask questions and need to share kind of comments about the things that are of importance to them. Um, that first meeting on Zoom was on April 22nd, but there is another for public library directors on April 29th. So if you did not have an opportunity to attend or anyone listening out there wants the opportunity to attend as a public library director, um, that registration is still open um, and can look to attend that next week. Uh, we did hear from that office that they are also looking at a similar option for school libraries um, that will be coming eventually so that they can have a chance to connect. For anyone who is attending the April 29th meeting, one of the things at the April 22nd meeting that was asked was, how can the Secretary of State better support libraries? What are the big issues that are currently facing you? What are the things that you're thinking about? So if you want to think about some of those things in advance of that meeting so you can have things to share, I know that they would appreciate that as well. Um, that is what I have for the Rails report today, but are there any questions about anything that appeared in the report or anything else that you would like to bring up? All right. Thanks, Monica. Of course. Uh, next, we have a report on the Rails discounts and group purchases program. Uh, Layla Heath and Jody Rubel will be presenting. Hi, everybody. I'm Layla Heath, Director of Library Resources and Programs, and the area I manage includes deals and discounts, which is what we'll be highlighting today. And Jody Rubel, who is our Rails Library Resource Specialist, will also be presenting. Um, you should all have a handout in your packet that contains some of the basic information, and I see Emily's put it up on the screen. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and it also contains some of the links that I'll mention today. So first of all, um, I like to begin by talking about the philosophy um, that we have at Rails for our uh, deals and discounts program. We are looking for partnerships with our vendors that will benefit our member libraries, and we want quality deals. So we want proven solid resources or trending new resources that offer a deep discount that translates into savings for our libraries. We also want transparency, logical pricing, and resources that will appeal to a large number of libraries. Um, next, I'd like to highlight what the deals and deals and discounts program um, brings to our members and to our vendors. So first of all, at Rails, we have a business strategy because we have a bird's eye view of the overall Rails landscape, and we can offer perspectives on ways that we can penetrate uh, the market and also to optimize deals. There are a lot of levels of complexity in the Rails landscape, and I know that, that you've heard some of this before, but we have library types, we have LSAP participations. There are just a lot of ways that we're structuring and looking at deals, and the needs of the subsets are very different, and they have to be analyzed according to that. So we, one thing we continue to work hard on is data. Um, as it relates to this program. And, and in doing so, it really filters to the um, entire organization. We're looking at savings, opportunities, and comparisons over a number of parameters, such as populations, operating expenditures, LSAP affiliation, and we work, hard, we work really closely with Grant Halter and Jeanette Durecki um, and other Rails folks on just organizing, maintaining, and then analyzing the data. Because of the vast amount of data that we work with, we're accustomed to handling large-scale operations, and these demand efficiencies in our procedures as the structure of the deal and also our building practices. Feedback is a really important piece of the deals and discounts program. Um, both we, we listen and connect with our expert librarians and folks and library staff um, often this happens, of course, through our networking groups and our listservs. Um, and one important one is the Elsom group. Um, it's the electronic subscription managers. They've been a huge help in identifying potential resources and providing feedback to us about them. We also reach out to other systems. 
and consortia statewide, such as Carly, IHLS, and even across the nation to other consortia. This feedback really informs many of our choices that regard in regards of deals to pursue, sometimes deals to sunset, um, but really in finding things that will be meaningful to our members. Um, as Monica alluded to, one of our recent reach outs from libraries has been for a couple of resources related to accessibility. So that went quickly to the top of the list and we're, we're in discussions with one of them uh, currently just to see you know, what that resource offers and, um, and if we can provide uh, some kind of discount for members in helping meet this important initiative. Uh, another thing that we can offer to our vendors is a marketing strategy, and that's really based on the, what's important to our libraries. What are they looking for and how can we reach them? And this changes and emerges as needs change, and we are able to, we, we really try to target our audiences who will benefit from the deal so that, you know, everybody's not inundated with things that are not relevant or, or potentially um, important to them. Um, one thing I'll mention at this point, just briefly, is um, the statewide e-resource package, because this comes up often when people are talking to us, and we are so grateful and excited that this initiative is going to happen. I'm really looking forward to the announcement of the, um, the package and, and what, um, what e-resources are going to be included. And when that happens, um, of course, we will support the state in any way that we can and are asked to do so, and we also um, will adjust whatever we need to adjust with our offerings accordingly. So um, we're just really looking forward to it and excited about it. We um, also provided some links. So we have two e-resource projects um, that were a result of uh, two different uh, groups reaching out to us. One of them was the Vendor Privacy Policy Project page. Um, Try saying that fast. <laughs> so <laughs> that page, um, actually, we were asked to become a repository for this um, by Elsom. Um, and it links, th this page links to privacy policies for third party vendors who provide e resources to public libraries. Every library can go in, they can add policies to it, but they can also just select from a menu that, oh, I've got this, 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 and this resource. And if the policies are already there, they are linked to it. So I would encourage any, and this is for public libraries right now. So if there are public libraries who um, are not yet participating, um, I would I would urge you to do so. And related to that is the VPAT page, which stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Um, that was actually initiated by Robin Hofstetter, who at the time was um, in Swan, and she was the e-resource manager there. And as part of a Rails grant project, um, she asked for funds, which we provided a program and also um, partnered with us to be a repository for these VPATs for public libraries. Um, there are VPATs out there. Carly has an extensive list for academic libraries, but there wasn't something in place at the time for public that was so readily accessible. So we have been, we have had that in place. Again, libraries can um, submit VPATs for uh, resources that they are using that are not already on the page, but also we have put a, a renewed focus on it given the concerns that have come up recently. Um, I would like to give a shout out to the librarians who helped manage that, Bill Cardew, Michael Campagna, and Lisa Green, as well as Brian Smith from Rails, who helps organize all of this on our website. Um, and we are going to be looking at um, some gaps. And I would also like to thank Aaron from SWAN who put a nice, summary of this on the director's listserv uh, this week and um, and also mention some gaps in relate, relation to some um, non-electronic resources, but things like the catalogs that, you know, again, we want to look at um, how our vendors are in compliance with, with accessibility. So we will be working on that. Um, our VPAC group is meeting next week to uh, just begin that or to continue that. Um, the budget implications, of course, are always top and foremost with deals and discounts. And one important thing is just when we work together, the economies of scale that Rails brings to uh, this process is really pretty amazing. We have 3,600 library buildings in Rails. I just think that is amazing. Um, 412 public libraries, 500 school um, systems, but 2,600 buildings. 
and then um, a couple hundred academics and specialists. So really a, a huge impact when we come to the table. And of course, even more across the state. And oftentimes we try to extend pricing statewide if we are, you know, either one of us are, are negotiating for something. Last year, our members actually saved over $2 million through deals and discounts. So, um, you know, we're always working on, on driving that number up. Um, products that we, some of the major drivers are Communico, Creator, Brain Fuse, Creative Bug, Swank, Press Reader, Gale Products, Quill, and, um, and you know, you hear Sharon talking about these two in, in our meetings every month. So we, we're really thankful, um, you know, to have our vendors who really are partners. I mean, they work with us, and, and the other thing that is happening now is that they are develop other products, and then we're, we're ready to go ahead and work with them on that product, and it's a much, much quicker product product project than when we're initially starting work with a vendor and kind of establishing that trust and establishing that relationship. So um, as this program is growing rapidly, we are going to be at 3 million or pretty close to it for this fiscal year. Um, this brings a need for just increased efficiencies, prioritization, so that we can maintain a uh, a sustainable program because as you all know, building is one thing, maintaining is a whole nother thing. So Consortium Manager is a platform that allows us to organize and track all of the multitude of steps in each deal, retrieve information and generate reports. Um, it wrangles all of that data that's associated with each deal. It includes library information like the population, your operating expenditures, library type contact info, um, LSAP affiliation, as well as vendor and product information. And then we put pricing structures in it overall and by library for each deal, and as well as your subscription start and end dates and whether you're renewing or new. So it keeps track of all of these things, what's accepted, rejected, pending, and really has proven to be a tremendous asset. There are now 60 consortia throughout the world, actually, that are subscribing to this product out of, they say, about 100 potential um, customers. So um, it's, it's really been helpful. And of course, one thing critical to the whole process is participation. And really, we cannot thank the libraries and enough for the, the support, enthusiasm, creativity, patience, um, that they have with, with the program and support at, for uh, deals and discounts. Um, our negotiations are based on potential. So the pow our power lies in the participation in that economy of scales we were talking about. Um, the other piece is the billing. Um, we bill through Rails whenever it's available, and that is really vital. And one of the reasons is um, for the oversight on the pricing. I weekly, I, I send back uh, invoices that are not correct for whether it's pricing, subscription dates, but um, you know that that results in, in savings. Um, and I'd also like to shout out to Deb Michener and Kim Perry in the finance department who keep track of all of the billing. They pay our vendors and they send the bills to you and keep track of all of that. So um, it, they do a fantastic, wonderful job. And um, this invoicing is also our best tool and control for quantifying the value of the deals and for the program. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Jody, and then if there's any questions, we can just take those at the end. Hi, I'm Jody Rubel, Library Resource Specialist. Can everyone hear me? Um, in the last few months, we excitedly launched 11 new resources to either existing offers or brought on new deals. Here are a few of the resources that we've launched. Um, an early literacy resources for ages three through elementary, homeschooling and independent learning resource that is des designed for exploration and interactive learning. For college bound students, a tool to navigate the college application process. Our newest resource is another option for patrons to complete their GED. And then for those, uh, Business Entrepreneur, a small, small business advisor that customizes local geographical data. And we've also expanded uh, products to our digital newspapers and magazines too. To get the word out about new resources, I coordinate with the vendor about informational webinars 
uh, um, offering webinars, uh, engages and informs the library staff about the product, and also um, helps them uh, with their own program management, like uh, reader's advisory tools, like for summer reading. Since September, we have offered uh, 17 vendor demonstrations, highlighting resources with over 170 registrants. Bringing on new resources is complex and takes time. Each deal is its own project and could just take a few weeks to many months to work through the different phases from exploring the product to negotiation and rollout process. As part of the building the partnership with the vendor, we take into consideration libraries that have already subscribed directly and we work uh, to uh, transition transition them over to the Rails discounted package. At the same time, while we're building programs, the team is preparing for the next round of subscription renewals, and we plan that four to six months in advance. During May, we will be revving up PEPSCO, Press Reader, ALA, RD, Toolkit subscription renewals. So it's just a few of the ones that we'll be uh, revving up. For more information about Rails deals, the discounts page, we will you will, where you will find a full list of offerings, free trial opportunities, webinar information, and pricing. Pricing tiers are sensitive and for Rails libraries only. Subscribe to the Rails e-news for promotions and upcoming webinars. Thank you for your time today. Do you have any questions? I do have one question. I know you mentioned feedback from the libraries. So how often is that taking place? I know you talked about getting information from listservs, but is there a central point, let's say you bring a vendor on and then after a few years, they're interested in raising prices and do you do at that time any type of surveying out to the people who may have used that product to kind of get some feedback directly from them? Or not, not in that particular interest or that particular um, angle yet. If they're raising prices, we are we're having conversations and it, we are we're never pro, you know, but um, we will have that kind of confirmation, the conversation, actually, if there is um, something that is really completely changing in a pricing structure, if it is going to have really big impacts on a really um, critical program. That is when we would do that kind of survey or really direct reach outs to impacted libraries because that that is really important. If it is a, a general pricing increase or something like that, it, it would it would be um, if it was pretty dramatic. That is when we would reach out regarding that. But to your point about getting gathering feedback, um, we we do we did just recently launch one. Um, it's this one is more directed to vendors, but also with the idea that we would be maybe offering figuring out something like this for our members. And this one is just a, a form where they can say, you know, we're interested in working with your library and they and it goes to our deals and discounts section. But Joni and I have talked about ways that we could do that for our members where they, they can always email us and do at our deals thing. And that is where we get a lot of feedback. But um, so having something like that, that's a little more form, you know, oriented that we can kind of track and, and make sure that we're responding and, and all of those things and, and getting back to people. But um, it's not to say that moving forward, especially once we sort of get the landscape after the, the deal statewide, if we're starting wanting to kind of do some different packaging kind of things, that might be a time that we reach out over the next year to see, hey, where are you seeing that we could be, a, you know, that we could help personally? Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, one, one question comes to mind. I, I recently ordered something and thought to myself, I should check. And sure enough, there, there, was a, there was a code that I could use to save money. And I thought to myself, if I hadn't checked, I mean, I, I, I do understand that maybe we shouldn't expect all vendors to go, actually, you could save money by, <laughs> no, no, I, I will call out Ingram. When I became an Ingram customer, they were the ones who said, oh, it looks like you'll, like, you'll qualify for the Rails um, discount. And I was so grateful for that. But what, what, would, how, what, what would be your feedback for that? Like, should, 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 should we hope, expect, not expect vendors to remind us of 
the thing that we should have known about? Well, my expectation is they will tell you, but okay. that doesn't mean that it is executed. And if it's something we're not bill, billing for, then I, I don't know. You yeah. know, I mean, I can't, I don't have oversight over it. Um, so really, I would say the, 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 the best thing to do is maybe just visit the page once a month, you know, just to sort of refresh. And I know that everybody's got a lot to do and that it's clunky, but that is kind of the best way because we, um, it is, you, you do have to be logged in to view those pages. Um, we do try to, you know, the communications team is great at just exploring different avenues and different ways to reach out and, 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 and let folks know. But um, to your point, I get it. You're just buying and, you know, it's like, well, it, it, it just takes some time. So I, I don't really have a, a better, I don't know, Dan, is there something when we you do, to that? When we do new, do, like new director visits, site visits, we tell people it's kind of a, it has to be sort of a two tier thing. It's one, talk to the vendor and say, do you have a Rails discount? Mm -hmm. Two, continue to visit that page on a regular basis. I know it's hard to remind yourself, I got to go back to that page and we'll see that sort of thing. But like monthly, quarterly, whatever it takes, because, um, you know, you don't know until you ask. Yeah. And, and in fairness to them, they sometimes, if it is a big organization, they have customer services reps that wouldn't even know. No, to right, so, yeah. right. So to Dan's point, yeah. Yeah. That's the yeah. Got it. Is it, is, is it um, effective for customers to, to ask a vendor, please participate in a Rails discount? Absolutely. Yes. I okay. Know. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yes, because there, there, there's a few vendors I know in the school library world where they they have some sort of a program for public libraries, and we're over here paying all the things we're paying, and and I've I've just tried to encourage my colleagues to every time you talk to that serve at that sales rep, mention to them, wouldn't it be great? We would love for you have you yeah looked into that. So I I didn't know if that ever if that ever came to fruition in anything. Oh, it does yeah, because okay. those resources, um, you know, they haven't maybe worked with libraries. I mean, like when you're talking about Gale or EBSCO, they are library vendors and they are they do a great job in this market. But there are other resources that emerge. Some of these are the accessibility ones. They may not have worked with a library group before. Um, and so, you know, we are we are happy to talk to them or they may be like you're saying a library resource and they just were not on their radar. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's it's not always clear. It is very Illinois landscape is not like any other. So um, the vendors just don't always know um, that that rails exists even. So um, we're happy to to explain to them and to to talk with them. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to reiterate for anyone who may not have been on the board for a super long time that this amazing work that is happening under Layla's direction and with great team members like Jody, this has grown astronomically over the last five years. Like this is a program that went from some savings, but very little, you heard Layla talking about $3 million in savings that goes directly back to members. So this is just another example of how resource sharing and economies of scale through the work that's happening at Rails can really directly benefit members. And we really appreciate the work that's happening here. It can also directly benefit the, the client, you know, the third party vendors. I mean, they're going to make a lot of a lot more sales and have a lot more um, points of contact than they'll ever get on their own. And we really, that is one thing that we really also stress with the vendors is their job is sales. Like once we set, you know, what, what we can do for them is really set everything so that they've got the best potential. They've got the best landscape they can have. And our libraries don't have to worry about Am I getting, you know, spend that time worrying about getting the best deal? It's the, the, that is that is situated, hopefully. So um, they can really concentrate on the benefits of their product and if it's appropriate for the library and how, and how it's appropriate. I would just like to add, thank you for reminding us to log in. <laughs> because I think there's so much that's in the yes. Rails website and you know, just the other day, I have a new staff member who came on board who emailed me and said, hey, can you see this program? I see it's on Rails. And I said, you too can log in. <laughs> Let's get you signed up for an account. Yeah. And I think you're right. Every day, things change. And there's just so many great opportunities for learning and for savings. Huge, right? So I think, yes, just the, that reminder that, you know, maybe once a week, log in and just see what's changed.
And I believe the Rails e newsletter does have that hyperlink, right? Yeah. So I'm like, that should be, if you sign up for the Rails e newsletter, that should be your monthly reminder, if anything. Yeah, and the website really, really is a, a just a huge, as you said, resource for folks, whether it is that continuing ed, deals and discounts, but then there's also just other news. Um, there's a whole My Library Is section for things that you're that have been developed that libraries can use for promotional purposes or to talk about their libraries. And so, um, yeah, it's just really, I don't know, Dan, is there anything you want to add for that? Yeah, it is a huge resource. And you get more when you log in. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Layla and Jody. Um, it's great to see this program continuing to grow. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Karen with the State Library Report. Hi, everybody. I am delighted to be here with you this afternoon, and I'm ready to go shopping after after that presentation. How cool is this? <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, well, as Monica shared, Secretary Janulius has been meeting virtually with staff from Heartland and Rails Libraries for a heartfelt conversation on the state of public libraries in Illinois. If you were unable to attend the first session, the next opportunity will be April 29th and pre-registration is required, but I would strongly recommend you to take advantage of this time to have a good conversation with the secretary. He really wants to hear your success stories and your challenges and what you are facing in your local library. Um, at the State Library, now is the time of year that our staff and others are busy reading grant applications and meeting with review committees. Now, this includes the public library construction grants, which the review committee met yesterday to make the recommendations, the adult literacy grant applications for family literacy grants, for adult volunteer literacy programs, workplace literacy programs. The review committees for literacy grants will meet later in May. The open educational resources grants, for ac from academic libraries for, for open source textbooks and ancillaries, which are quizzes or videos, supplementary materials to, to make a richer class. Um, and, and these are all provided at no cost to students, so they don't have to buy textbooks. These are amazing applications and the review committees are actually meeting this week. Also, proposals from the for the e-resources packages are being reviewed right now. And unfortunately, I can't share any other details because of confidentiality, but just know that those proposals are all in and they are being reviewed. I'm excited to hear the results too. Now, to take it down a level, um, because sometimes you need also need that high touch with these, we just mailed certificates for participants in the Read for a Lifetime program to participating teachers. Students in their classrooms read a minimum of four books out of 20 titles, and several of the students read all 20 titles. Now, the fiscal year 25 school year Read for a Lifetime book list is finalized, and I think it's being released either this or next week. To participate in the annual Letters About Literature program, over 3,000 Illinois students wrote letters to authors. They actually mailed them to us, not to the authors. But they shared how reading that author's book changed that student's perspective or somehow they changed what they were doing in their life. It made a difference for that student's. Certificates for the finalists and the honorable mentions have been mailed to all of the participating schools to present locally to the students. And the three winners will be announced at a special ceremony on May 1st with Secretary Janulius. And we always say that boxes of Kleenex will be available as the students read their letters. In addition, 10 adult literacy tutors 
and 10 adult literacy learners from around the state will also be recognized at Spotlight on Literacy Ceremony with Secretary Janulius in May. If you, if you or if you know of any adults that dabble in writing poetry, please encourage them to enter the Illinois Emerging Writers Competition. This competition is open to anyone over the age of 18 who, who would like to write poetry, and entries are due June 30th. There are cash prizes, and the winning poems are submitted to publications for possible publication in their journals. If you'd like to hear more about our grant programs, opportunities, reading, writing programs, just let me know. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. All right. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank Karen. you. Karen. All right, moving on to new business. Uh, Monica will start us off with the draft fiscal year 2025 uh, operational plan outline. Thank you, Alex. So I know you all saw in your packet um, the draft fiscal year 2025 operational plan. Um, just as a reminder, this month we review the plan. Um, any questions that you have, we're happy to answer. Um, and then you will see the plan again in a potentially revised format next month, um, at which point you will look at uh, reviewing and approving uh, the plan. So I did in the memo just create some highlights based on both expenses that we are currently expecting to increase based on uh, what Sharon and I have been working on uh, in the budget process, uh, but this goes uh, very, very wide in terms of the work that goes into the operational plan uh, and budgeting piece. All staff at Rails really know how important this process is and provide a lot of feedback throughout this process. There's a lot of work that goes into the compilation and the pieces that are there. And so I do wanna acknowledge and thank the staff uh, for their work on this process. Um, so in the memo, you will see some of those expenses that uh, we have already identified uh, that you will expect to see in some of our numbers next month as well as highlights of some of the initiatives that you'll see further in the plan. Um, so I just wanted to open it up in case anyone had questions or if you have things that you were uh, pleased to see in the plan. Um, so I wanted to open it up to the group at this point. Well, I want to say that I think when, when an organization is working at already a high level, right, it's one thing to say, we're going to keep doing it. It's all good. But but you know, you know that your members want even more and you want more for our organization. And so I love to see that we're at the high level and yet there's there's really cool increases and 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 new additions on there. Um so I I want to just acknowledge that. There was one that caught my eye. Hold on. Um I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> Thanks, <Monica. laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. That's one. <laughs> Monica thinks about that. <laughs> Just chime in. Yes. Well, a lot of work going in here. Yes. Um, and I, I would just like to call out because I know that the um, social social justice for libraries course from Freedom Freedom Lifted yes. was made available as a library system, my library system was interested in, and we learned, oh, it really doesn't apply to every member of your staff because it's through rails, only a limited number of staff from each library can utilize it. And so, yes, I'd be very much interested in, you know, are there options for training all of our staff? Mm -hmm. um, I think this is an important topic, and as we're seeing EDI across the board in many schools and libraries sort of those positions being taken away and that being questioned i think it's really important um and um i would also like to add to that um maybe some coursework on emotional intelligence because i think that's a key component of beginning this work thank you thank you Yuan. i found it <laughs> but, I, but i don't want to jump on anyone else's toes the, the the thing that caught my eye that i was really pleased about i think especially because um, my board seat represents school libraries, which in the past have had probably a varying degree of engagement with Rails. Um, I'd love to see this uh, member engagement measurement tool 
that seems so cool. And I, I'm, I'm going to be like all ears and eyes when, um, when, when, when that is thought of and, and rolled out. And I think really um, will do a great, a great thing to help members, um, to help our school library members in particular, to kind of judge themselves like, gosh, what am I doing? What am I not doing? What could I be doing? As well as to give this system the chance to see who in particular might need, um, you know, a little, a little wave or a little help. I will just say um, we are also very excited <laughs> about that process. Um, some of us were introduced to the concept of a, a tool that specifically measures member engagement and consortium at uh, ICOLC back in 2023 from, I believe it was North Carolina Live, um, who presented on a program that they do. And so uh, came back very excited from that conference um, and talked to Dan and some folks from marketing and communications. They were like, oh yeah, we've already been <laughs> thinking about this. This is the thing we'd like to be doing too. So there was a lot of kind of like synergy around the ideas behind that and in talking with the data team. So it's something we talked a lot about in the last year, but we think this year we're, we're well positioned to actually make it happen. And so we're really excited about that possibility. Yes, yes. And this this is an old school thing, but I'm glad it's here, is really just that idea of sometimes it's best to just mail a piece of paper. Um, and so the you know, it's listed here specifically under member engagement to to just share in paper form to you know promotional pieces that people might not have seen. Um, a I, lot of that came from this group. I mean, we had those discussions yeah. in the board meetings that allowed for for some of those changes. And and I think the the high quality um, of promotional pieces that are developed by Rails, um, they 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 do exactly what you want. They catch your eye. I mean, I have I have they're all pretty on my, on my board. <laughs> even even because even though I know that stuff, right? I still want to see them and um, and have them in front of my eyes. Yes. I would like to point out too, just again, from the trustee perspective, um, I'm really excited to see the initiation and the first steps of the ILE trustee training portal. Um, I hope that, and just the EDI conversations you all have happening, and there's just so many really great things coming up and to find ways, and you mentioned specifically providing spaces for trustees to network. I think that that is a hugely important thing. You know, we have other groups that are working on those things, but, um, you know, it's a, it can be very siloed when you are a trustee and a different, you know, and you get to talk to other towns and other people and that networking and that, um, creating a network, uh, support group, um, I think is really vital and will help all trustees come to a gathered understanding and, a um, you know, more unified front when it comes to, dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges of library trustee work. And we should honestly point out library trustee volunteerism. So <laughs> yeah. that is an important center in those things. Is, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Well, I've been very happy in the last few years to see Rails integrating more with Carly as the academic library consortium. And I hope that that will continue to grow and I Try and kind of go back and forth between Carly and encourage them to do it because we're all in this together. And there are certain things that Carly does for academic libraries that Rails does for other types of libraries. But still, there's other things that maybe can work together and help everyone learn and uh, grow together. That's right. And I'll just have one more thing to add. This is really for Sharon. Um, because it looks like all of you guys are working, obviously, on the budget. Um, how are we with wages? Because are we, with all this implementation of, like, new things, um, do we have enough staff at Rails to handle all this? And hopefully Dan can keep his mental state leveled. Like, I, I, I'm more worried about, like, when you're adding more things to the plan, then that gets everyone thin in, in regards to, like, well, how much more can I, you pile on me? As many new initiatives is great, but then it's just like, are we are we putting in funds into the wages to make sure that if we need to hire an assistant or outsource or you know what I mean? I, I just don't know. Are we okay in that level? 
um, and there will be um, some new positions that are that will be um, incorporated into the budget and have already been incorporated into the budget and some increased hours too in a couple of areas as well um, for folks that um, have been part-time um, up till now. So we are reevaluating that and um, we have, um, and I don't remember seeing it on the plan, but we have done an across the board benchmarking as well. In the memo. Yes, and um, changes have been incorporated into the budget um, regarding that as well. And even though this is more, I think it still has to do with us, but our staff allow to use sick days for mental days, just in case they're over, like they're done. They're just I mean, done. By, by state law, they can, they can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Be surprised. People, yeah. You know, businesses say, yeah, we do that. And it's like, no, the staff, like, no. Um, no, I just want to make sure, because, or... Even though it's state mandated, your delivery guys, all the staff are aware that they're able to take mental days, right? Yes, I mean it's, like, it's in our policies, and and we can certainly do that. But yes, I, I policies. That's the thing. I understand, and so it is really important to us that our staff are coming to us as a whole person, and that they're not overloaded. Um, so I think what you'll see in terms of new initiatives, it's a mix of kind of brand new things, but it's also things that ultimately really help to make our jobs more focused and us to set priorities in ways that allow us to figure out how to put our energies in place. Things like that member engagement kind of data piece allows for us to know more about how to organize and focus the work that we're doing. But, you know, there's always opportunities for us to be able to do more. We have members all the time who are asking for us to do more. And we have to make really careful decisions about how we choose what those new initiatives would be, both so we don't overload staff, but also to understand the sustainability of our budget and salary long term. And noting that we want our staff to be well compensated because we want to make sure that we can retain the best quality staff. And we have an incredible staff here at Reels. And that's a lot of what the benchmarking process that we just went through and finished was about. And we'll be hearing more about that in terms of the budget landscape and some of the decisions that we have made in relation to that. But we are we are very pleased with some of the results that have come back in terms of pay equity and how Rails is situated in terms of pay equity for those roles after they've been newly reevaluated. I was interested to see the uh, Find More Illinois uh, user groups yeah. that are being considered, um, as well as uh, some possible enhancement add-ons. Is there any thoughts about what those might include, or is that still in development? Well, we have had a lot of conversations this year around Find More because after finishing the promotional period of Find More, which was really about growth for Find More, now we're at a point where we really need to evaluate Find More as a sustainable product that's actually useful to all the folks who are using it and that it's priced correctly for the people who are interested in joining. So a lot of the work that we're planning in this coming year is really about bringing together groups of um, some of the users of Find More to represent a variety of different libraries that are using the product to talk more about the improvements that they would like to see, but also who it would be helpful to bring into the program to make it even more useful to them and make the, the product more useful long-term. Um, we had done a lot of evaluation this last year of the potential of the Verso product. Um, um, and with the help of a consultant, um, we really help to see that the focus of where Find More needs to be is on the usability of the actual Find More product and making sure that it's sustainable long term in terms of who's in that group. Um, but we are also looking at the fee structure sort of in the same way that we looked at the E-Read Illinois fee structure with our data team to make sure that it's priced equitably and sustainably to take it into the future. So a lot of the work we're planning is about how to make sure that Find More is successful long term. Um, and with the addition of all the CCS libraries that just came on, as well as plenty of other libraries, we're very excited about some large scale libraries that have come on board. Uh, we want to make sure that that kind of momentum continues. And to add on to that sustainability yeah. piece as well. Um, so um, Ann Slaughter, our director of technology services, just negotiated a five year contract with our yes. partner, um, for the ILS platform for Find More. So she locked us in for fees for five years to achieve what she called game game changing pricing yeah. for those five years. So that that's going to play into fees and sustainability as well. But the, the ILS platform, is that Verso or is that the core uh, parrot? Yes, okay. from autographic question. Yeah. Well, I would like to 
been super successful at it, but getting more academic libraries to participate, and I'd be happy to help with that or do what I could. There's groups working on that for next year. We have you on our list <laughs> already, because that is that is something that we hear consistently from the folks that are purchasing participating, excuse me, and find more is that they would see considerable added value from more academic participants. And we've heard from act academic participants that the fee structure doesn't really work for them in terms of what they're looking at. So that's one of our first priorities in terms of looking at fee structure as well. I'll beat the drum one more time and say non-returnables. <laughs> All right, if there are no other comments on the draft operational plan, uh, next we have a review of bylaws and library system. Thank you, Alex. Um, so this uh, memo that you saw here, this really came out of some discussions that we had had within the rail staff after looking at things around the board election and some questions that came up. Um, so we wanted to review this with you because we haven't done this in a while. Um, so what you see included in your packet is both a copy of the bylaws and that kind of goes through all the aspects um, of, of work, but of course it also does speak to things like term limits um, and our own ability to, to rerun. And then we also included a section um, from the System Act that really speaks specifically to how uh, these terms need to work. Um, so this is really intended as a review, which mostly says we have a number of people on our board who are appointed. Um, those folks are appointed sometimes midterm or sometimes almost towards the end of a term. Um, we do have a responsibility, um, especially as it has been updated through some of the legislation that came that says we need to put somebody into an open seat within 90 days, which means even if someone lets go of their term towards the end, we can't just wait until another election in order to fill that. We have a responsibility to create an appointment. Um, and so what that means is if you are appointed, then that counts for the purposes of the law because of what's in the Library System Act as one full term. Um, so you are able to run again for re-election for a total of these two full terms, even if it's less than six years. Um, you cannot run again after that because that would take it longer than six years long term. Um, and so we just want to kind of review that um, in terms of what was available currently and then just ask if there were any questions. Again, we're not deciding on anything or creating um, any new action today. This is just intended as a review and discussion of the bylaws and the Library System Act. Yes. Um, I know that a lot of policies are going to the policy committee to be rewritten, you know, to be updated with um, the under E for term. You know, it says a term of office of director shall be years. Um, I just I got confused because, you know, I'm not a director and not all of the board members are directors. So I'm just wondering if when this goes to policy committee to be updated, that should say board member, correct? Well, and I think it's referring to board of directors in terms of the bylaws discussion, but I, I do know that that can be confusing. Because at first, a lot of people didn't know they could be on the board of rails because they thought they had to be a director. And so when I read this, it went right back to that old school way of thinking. And I thought, well, I hope that needs to be at least clarified a little bit better. Under Article 5 Governance A, it says System Board of Directors. So that's what you all are. <laughs> okay. But it I does create I some confusion. I understand that. I knew it meant me, but I, I thought, you know, just something that you could get confused on. Thank you, Karen. Well, I don't think the policy committee is going to review the bylaw. At this point, we don't have the bylaws like in full as a review on our schedule. Um, I think, you know, we do always review the bylaws as part of our orientation process each year. And so if there are ever things that this board would like to bring up as potential amendments to the bylaws, you can see we have amended the bylaws. They were last amended, I think, in May uh, 2021. Um, so it is a possibility for the board to be able to do that if you know something that you would like to have further discussion on. Um, but like anything, uh, the, the board typically votes on those changes as a body, you know, for things that would happen, especially when it comes to bylaws.
Any other questions? We appreciate the opportunity to bring it to your attention. It came up with us, and so we wanted to share and make sure we were on all same page. And that was all. Yeah. Uh, so next, we'll review uh, the executive director evaluation process for this. The other input from all of the board members, the evaluation will be sent out in the form of a survey, uh, which will include four sections. Uh, the first one will be organizational goals, which the board approved uh, last year for this fiscal year. Uh, board members will rate each uh, goal on a range of one to four, uh, and also have a place for comments for each of those. Uh, performance factors, including core values, uh, specific uh, executive director competencies, board relations, leadership and management ability, building a strong organization, external communications, and relationship building, again, with a rating and a comment box for each section. A summary of overall performance on a scale of one to four with space for comments, and a comment box with suggestions for goals for the coming fiscal year. I'll send the link out in the next day or two to all of the board members. Uh, please complete that by May 15th so that we can compile the results. I will share those with the board before the May meeting, uh, and we'll discuss the executive director evaluation in closed session at the June meeting. Uh, the board will also determine uh, any change in compensation for the executive director to coincide with the change in compensation for all other rail staff at the start of the new fiscal year. Uh, then I and Vice President Glenn Gregory uh, will meet with Monica to discuss the evaluation uh, and recommendations from the compiled evaluation. Uh, are there any questions or comments about that process? Okay, uh, look for that in your email in the next day or two. We're just finishing up uh, the survey. Uh, Emily, I think we're almost all done. Oh, all good. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that brings us to our board development topic, which is uh, digital marketing and communications initiatives, uh, which Ola will present. Share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. <laughs> So this presentation comes at a really good time because the last time I gave a board update was last May. So we have about a full year of projects to walk you guys through. Um, so just to begin with, in case you're not familiar of where you can find rails right now, the three that we use on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, are Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. X is a little bit of a contentious topic in the social media space right now. We do see engagement on that platform decreasing just because of the sheer amount of people leaving that platform. We're still active on there right now, but you can probably expect us to probably slowly sunset that platform. But we will continue to be using Facebook and Instagram. Those are the top two platforms. That is where our audience is. And then... A close runner up is LinkedIn. We're a little bit more selective with what we post on LinkedIn because of the nature of the social media platform. It's based a lot more around networking. Professional organizations will post legislative updates there as needed. However, we also try to show our company culture on LinkedIn because a lot of people do job hunting. So we want them to get a sense of what it might be like if they worked here at Rails. So we try to post a lot of our fun stuff so they know that, you know, we, we do good things in the office too. To less of a social media platform, but just the website where we host all of our video content. And then TikTok, we have not used in the past year. However, we've got Jessica Silva, our new <laughs> member engagement specialist here, who has a ton of creative ideas uh, for us to get started on there. So expect some, some silly fun content in the next few weeks. Dancing. Oh, I don't know. I know. We'll see. That you're just gonna have to follow us to see if, if we follow <laughs> that. Um, so before I get into more of the projects that we've worked on, I wanted to give you guys a sense of the principles that lay the groundwork for everything we put online. These are what I call like the keys to success on social media. The first one is featuring real people. So despite the fact that social media seems like it could be very shallow and surface level, the core of it is really to connect people with one another. So anytime 
that we can share a photo of a real library worker in our system or share a story about our members, those are just guaranteed to have high engagement because people want to feel connected and they want to see themselves in other people. The second is the idea of being a little bit playful. It's really important to us that people don't look at us as an intimidating government organization. We want them to see Rails as an organization made up of real people with personalities, and those personalities are probably very similar to our audience. So we wanna make sure, again, that we humanize the organization. Going along with that is the idea of authenticity. It's important that we not only say that we value something, but show actions that exemplify we follow through with what we say we want to do. So sharing stories that show examples of how we're following our strategic plan and just emphasizing that we follow through with our word builds trust with us and our members. And then lastly, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation is that everything on social media should be short. People do not have long attention spans, especially <laughs> when they're scrolling on social media. So whether it's a video or a text post, you wanna make sure it's really digestible, broken up in pieces. And if you do have a really complex idea that has a lot of information, link that to a website, link to another document, but the actual thing on social media should be very short. In terms of our growth, like I said, the last time I gave this presentation was last year. So we have two 12 month periods to measure here. So I'll begin with Facebook. Uh, the top bar there is our engagement. So that is the number of interactions we're getting on a post. So a like, a comment, a share. And then the reach on the bottom is just the number of people that are seeing our content. So the blue on the left measures the period of April 2022 to March of 2023. And the gold on the right is April 2023 up until last month, March 2024. Engagement on Facebook is up 60% and the reach on Facebook is up 45%. And on Instagram, much of the same trends. Uh, engagement is 69% and reach is up 35%. Something to note about these numbers is that they are all organic. And when I say that, I mean, we didn't put any money into this. So there's no algorithm other than the natural one that exists on social media that's boosting this content. So it's when people like it, it's making more people look at it. When you comment on it, it really helps. So you can only imagine the numbers that it would be if we threw money at this problem, but I think we're doing it great. Doesn't seem like a it. problem, really. It seem to be, <laughs> Not a yeah. problem. Okay, so now I'm just going to walk you through a few different highlights of our social media campaigns in the past year. A new thing we started was the From the CE Archives posts. These are published on the first Friday of every month. I collaborate with uh, Diana Rush from CE, who does a great job of surveying the landscape and figuring out what issues that are affecting our library right now. And then she goes back into the CE archives and tries to find a webinar that is applicable to the issues people are facing today. So this is just an incentive for people to access the hundreds of video that, videos that are available to all Rails members um, at any time. Back in the fall, we collaborated with Heartland to throw the eRead Illinois 10th anniversary party at the ILA conference. So of course we had a big campaign online leading up to the event to entice people to come, used the same imagery throughout, but kind of took it toward different angles. So save the dates, uh, sponsor features, and then of course stats celebrating the success of the program. At the end of the year, we did a hashtag delivery wrap. This, if anyone's unfamiliar, is a play on Spotify's uh, Spotify Wrapped. So Spotify is a music streaming platform that essentially collects data of your listening habits throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, it comes up with these fun, colorful graphics, uh, kind of summarizing your behavior so you could share it with your friends and see what your, what your listening habits were. They get kind of 
freaky with how specific the stats are. So we tried to make it a little bit more fun with ours too, um, with our delivery stats. So we took the big numbers, like the total amount of items delivered and translated that into dollars saved. Um, again, with the amount of miles that our delivery drivers traveled, translated that into traveling around the world 47 times, which is insane. Um, and again, appealing to that human aspect, adding in pictures of our delivery drivers who had the longest route. Uh, so yeah, that was just our way of piggybacking off of, you know, a social media trend that goes on pretty much annually every year. I don't see that going away. So I hope we do it again this year. In early 2024, we were getting ready to officially launch the Slate Data Dashboard. So Jeanette DeRucky and I collaborated on running a social media campaign leading up to the launch of the dashboard just to generate some interest and discussion around the topic. So Jeanette did a great job of giving me really intriguing stats and facts, of course, all backed by data, that we then paired with some bold eye-catching graphics, again, just to generate discussion about the importance of having certified school librarians in school libraries. The Rail Staff Engagement Committee coordinates these monthly themed celebrations. And one of the things that they provide staff with is a list of resources available to them through Rail services such as Explore More and eRead related to that monthly topic. So what I did is, again, piggybacking off of other people's ideas, is I created a graphic to accompany that list and I put that out on our social media. This is a highly, highly needed resource from our libraries. The engagement on these posts of dark boosted our numbers <laughs> because so many libraries do not have staff dedicated solely to marketing. And so anytime that we can put out content that is pre-packaged, they don't need to change anything, they can just Press share and give that directly to their patrons makes a huge difference in them being able to promote these resources. Some familiar faces over here. <laughs> of course, we just wrapped up board nomination period. We took, of course, the headshots of our very generous board volunteers who spoke with us about why they joined the Rails board and why they think others should consider joining as well. And then we have some multimedia projects we've worked on. Of course, we continue doing the Rails Minute every single month. But back in September, we actually started making it available as a podcast. So because the information that is in the Rails Minute is kind of just like the quick bullet points that every member should know about, we want to make sure it's accessible from any sort of platform. So you can listen to it on the go if you don't have that moment to sit and physically watch it with your eyes. Uh, the last member update, we created a waiting room video. So this is a one minute passive slideshow that briefly touches on each of our areas of service. Um, this is intended for any time you have a Zoom event where there is a waiting room and people are waiting to get into your event, you have a captive audience. So we decided why not use that space to advertise what we have to offer. Again, the board nomination video, Tom did a good job of kind of laying that out for me earlier, so I don't have too much more to say on this other than um, we just did a nice little interview style video, super short with clips of people who um, are trying to persuade others to join the board. And some future projects we have to look forward to, of course, the board election is just around the corner, so we're sitting down this year. Uh, with each board candidate and making them film hopefully a 90 second video each. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> we'll see um, just talking about why they're running and why people should vote for them it's also a way for people voting to show their appreciation to the people willing to serve on the board by you know give, give them a watch see why they're passionate about running and support them that way uh, speaking of Find More Illinois, we are going to work on a promotional video about uh, the platform. 
we're hoping to sit down with Rails members who already use Find More Illinois to talk about how it's benefited them so that other people are also compelled to join the program. And Slate, again, we want to make, again, a kind of like more of an introduction video, just exemplifying how you can use that data dashboard realistically to advocate for yourselves and your schools. Um, we just want to show the practical use of the platform instead of just giving you the dashboard and you have to figure it out yourself. We want to walk people through it a little bit more. We're also working with the data team and CE to analyze our YouTube video performance. YouTube gets really detailed with how much you can see about people watching your video. I can tell you where your attention waned, where you're, where uh, you're finding the videos, if you're being referred from our website or if you're watching them directly in YouTube. So we want to take that data to inform our future video projects. Excitingly, we are looking into launching a Rails online store where people can get Rails branded merchandise, things like t-shirts, stickers, and mugs. Um, yes, you can get the Rails logo, but we're also looking to design some just general library and book related content. We want to make it a little bit fun uh, so our members or any Rails fans can, uh, can wear our merch and spread the word about libraries. Yeah, stickers That's is stickers. very exciting. <laughs> yeah, I know. Stickers, stickers on like everyone's laptop in this. <laughs> um, and the very last thing is just I feel in the past year we've laid a really firm foundation for our social media here. So I'm looking forward to moving out and getting to talk with our member marketers specifically to gauge their needs and figure out how we can work together to continue promoting their value to their community. And I'll take questions. Ah. Renee. Okay, as our number one social media fan. <laughs> you guys are killing it. I'm killing it. Killing yes. It. Like, we get so many compliments from people saying, like, I know that Rails exists now as often yeah. as possible because it's just coming up a lot more. You, the Good. word is out there. Obviously, for you as a new employee, Jess you are just like in the golden era of rails right now because <laughs> just you know knock on uh, hopefully this is real wood <laughs> you guys are doing an extraordinary job please keep it going keep your mental state great <laughs> um the other thing too um other than that is i know at one point we were discussing about changing explore more illinois because of the fact that we're having other services outside the state yes. are, are you still thinking of doing that there's discussion about rebranding yes all right cool um Sometime this year and then the brand clothing thing is amazing yeah. i think it's one of those things too i forgot there's other libraries that do it but um rails doesn't make any portion what it is is the third party essentially you have it offered there and then they can buy it at full price. Is that what I'm assuming? So we were looking into options, again, that a lot of other libraries participate in. Um, we were looking at options where we are allowed to set the price point so we can make sure it breaks even. We don't would not take any profit from... Like Threadless or... Exactly, yes. That Threadless is a popular platform. But we want to make it clear also, like we're going to go around all the legal red tape of that to make sure that the money, if there's any profit being made for that, just gets put back into the services we set out. But we'll make that language clear. But being able to set the price point is definitely um, the most important part of that. Just again, kudos. Cause I can, since I've been here, what was it? I don't even know when it <laughs> but when I first started, there wasn't much. It was a long, there was a long time ago. <laughs> Some gray hair. Um, the marketing just wasn't like up to right now where we are, like trending as much. It wasn't anywhere. Yeah. I thought Rails was about trains. Well, that's yes. that's not. Yeah. Was there was no marketing, really. I, I think you guys are really stepping forward. I do love the progress. Do continue what you're doing. I just cannot wait to see you guys all dance. I, I can already <laughs> think of it. The... Rope you into some of those. No, not at all. <laughs> And that was like three minutes. We got Renee's bloopers. But hopefully the TikTok video, you guys can come out with like an office 30 second skit. 
And just to see, just to see Monica and Joe. Oh God! And oh, acting. Joe's like, how you yeah, you're you're gonna gonna be be <laughs> So, but anyway, I just yeah. again love what you're doing. Please continue doing it. And I just love the fact that I'm hearing it from Rural Side Libraries. And great. Yeah. So then you know the words are. Yeah. I I just want to add on to that a little bit. You know, I know what I see as a board. But I like to see the people who actually work at Rails and how they get along. Because, man, I've worked at places where it sucks. But it looks like everybody just gets along so well. I, I The one with y'all planting plants out on yeah. your was just really nice. You know, it was topical. It was nice to see everybody doing that. When you have your, your chili cook-off or your cookie. The charcuterie day was. Well, there was some bread. <laughs> It was like a bread baking competition or something. I mean, it's nice to see that as a board member, that a happy workplace. You know, I like that. You know, even if no one else sees it, it made my day, you know. I'll take it. <laughs> well, and in my in my history, before I was on the board, one of my best CEs was an Instagram. Um, and it was like a it was like two hours and two hours. And I thought, wow, how it was one of the best things I ever went to. And I can do not, that's going to be nothing in no. comparison to the CE that, that I think you should give yeah. and that I would love to learn um, from, from everyone here because yeah. I, truly, yeah. truly, I think the, 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 the work processes and, and the ideas yeah. and the, the sustainable, all of it is so good. And, and I think though those engagement numbers growing 60% um, is, is, um, is no mystery. So yay. Thank you. I am actually uh, giving a social media 101 presentation at the ILA Marketing Forum mini conference in May. Okay, so working on it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a comment. So um, people are 100%, obviously, like the numbers don't lie that people are looking about things, but there's conversation about them, which I think is just as important to consider. Um, I, I was chatting, I got texts, people are like, you're all over. You're all over right Your now. Face is yeah. <laughs> I, it was like I haven't talked about it yet. You know, I'm like still stuck in checking teams when you walk in. There. But um, the other question is, how is um, Rails approaching archiving this information and keeping kind of all that together? How do you yeah think about that? Records retention is a hot topic, especially in libraries because the rules are so vague. Um, so I just started a couple months ago instead of going through a service that archives it. I just have a document of the photos, the alt text I provide in the captions. And that way I have a record of all the things that I post. Um, of course, like Facebook has some limited archiving abilities, but you can't always guarantee that they'll be there forever. So for right now, we're working with a Word document, but it is something that like me and a lot of other marketers on those email lists have been talking about. It's just vague. That's why like my library hasn't gotten into TikTok yet because we haven't found a way that we can consistently archive yeah. and look at compliance. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, on the same token, and on the other hand, I will point out, I believe the Milwaukee Public Library got nominated for a Peabody because of their They're TikTok. <laughs> so, it, you know, there's hopefully some space in there to make it worth on both. Absolutely. Is there any kind of something going on with TikTok where it's going through... Oh, yeah. The Senate or the something to try to ban it. I just, yeah. I don't know very much about it, but I, I think I'm it's on it. apparently it's going to be banned. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> apparently because they've been talking about it for so long and you can still do your dance on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Why don't just go on oh, yeah. You can still, the content doesn't exactly. Yeah. Just so I'm saying, you know, I'll look for it on Instagram. Absolutely. I have six it's months of self. Like at my previous job, and most libraries do this. You create a TikTok, but then you post it to Facebook and Instagram. So everything's always like cross all over in that way. Uh, so you won't miss it regardless. Um, it'll be interesting to see. You know, Dan and I were just talking like social media just changes on, on a daily, weekly basis. So the TikTok ban is the hot topic of the week, and it'll be interesting to see. How that plays out but I'm, I'm not too worried about it right now <laughs> i do want to piggyback on to something uh jennifer said um so i started a new job in march and i was so i don't really know it's a bigger library i don't know everybody but as i was walking um across the floor one of the younger um 
workers there, staff members, said, stopped me and said, oh, I just saw you. Uh, on the radio on Instagram. And I, I didn't know. <laughs> it was your um, was trustee, oh, yeah. uh, the video I had made. And uh -huh. um, I don't think she saw the video, but she saw that. Yeah. So, There's you know, that caught me off guard, too. So mm -hmm. people are seeing it. Yes. Like That's the younger right. people yeah. who are on Instagram um, are seeing it. Because, you know, I don't. I see numbers, but it's hard to like boil it down to what actually sticks with people. So I love hearing all of that feedback. I think one of the things we have talked about so much is how we can connect with people at all levels of library work within Rails and not just library directors or library trustees. Um, and I think that a lot of the work that Ola has put into our social media platforms has really made a difference in that kind of recognition. When I was at PLA at Columbus um, earlier this month, uh, I heard directly from a lot of people who said that seeing those posts helped them feel connected to Rails in a different way, where it personalized the work that was happening and the individuals who work here so that they understand it better um, and they know who the board members are, they know the work that's happening, and that work is what allows that to happen. Happen. So it's really valuable what you're doing. Yeah. Short of offering to dance, which I'm not, <laughs> what, what other ways can 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 uh, um, board members keep help, help yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah. At keep, the very help. least, just like it when you see it. Give us <laughs> it could be a pity like, but <laughs> pity like. At least like it if you can comment. What's the emoji for pity like? Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> A like, a comment will go a long way. If you feel so inclined to share, great. Add a few comments, go for it. But just keep keep liking it. That's how social media works. The more people like it, the more people see it. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't take a lot. Just a little tap. Thank you. I just also want to say that I've just been loving all the social media stuff that you've been putting out there and thank you for reaching out to us to participate in it because it's made it even more fun and more just, I don't know, just more connected. And I just want to make sure I threw my two cents too because I've really been enjoying all this stuff that's been posting. And thank you all for volunteering. I know nobody likes to get their picture taken. Nobody mm -hmm. likes to be on video, but it really does make the content so much more engaging. So. I need volunteers at any time and I'm happy to take you and walk you through it and make it as hopefully as quick and painless as possible. Like looking at you, Renee, <laughs> that was hopefully it wasn't too bad. Um, but anytime we can use your voices, it's really helpful. I love that we all kind of unintentionally color coordinated. We were really very did. much and we're on different days. Like I came on a day by myself. So I don't know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's just that bored mind meld. You know, <laughs> purple, red, yeah. the maroon era. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to Rails board member reports. Does anyone have any news about their library to share this month? I'll do one. Well, go ahead. Okay. Oh. Um, I will share. We So yesterday we had our staff day. Um, and so in addition to disability awareness training, um, which our staff loved, 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 and afterwards they said, more, please, right? We want to, again, this goes back to the accessibility and ensuring that we are doing all that we can to support every member of our community. Um, but addition, in addition to that, we did a spring cleaning. And I know it's something that has never been done before, but I think as libraries, we collect a lot of stuff and librarians tend to be boarders. And so it's really good to sort of clean out our space sometimes to make sure that we have room for new things. And so um, the feedback from the staff was just really good. And I just wanted to share that because it is something that we don't often recognize. You know, when we think about take a moment here, that's an elephant day, clearing out your space. Free. You take advantage of the Rails page, post those things that you're trying to get rid of. Because let me just tell there's enough libraries that will definitely take some of that stuff. Um, my board finally approved a new website. 
So we moved forward with library market, looking forward to that. One of the biggest things that I didn't even uh, think that it was, I already knew it was a big issue. I just didn't know there was gonna be this hot topic this week, but the whole accessibility. So it was just nice already having that conversation, already having those type of questions with that vendor that once it brought up, I obviously share those, those remarks on the uh, director's list. But um, I'm just looking forward to it just because there's so many things that a library does and you'd be surprised what a website could help if it's actually done correctly. Um, so I'm looking forward to that process. It's 22 weeks of fun. And I don't have, I have one marketing assistant, but I'm all, I'll be the guy and my head of tech will, will be the ones in charge of the website. So that's the one that's uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Great library market folks, great to work with. And hopefully they will be, I did mention it to Ben, who's the CEO, to say, hey, do you want to add a discount for, for the Rails members? So it's, it's we do, we do encourage uh, different, or I do encourage other vendors to be part of that list just because it is beneficial and it helps a lot of libraries. So hopefully, like Karen said, uh, they take advantage of that by creating their, uh, increasing their client list. Not library directly related, but um, the Laconi Trustee Banquet will be happening on Friday, May 3rd. It is sold out and we increased our uh, ticket capacity by 25%. So we uh, have a bigger group than last year. We had to go to the next floor to <laughs> make space for everybody. Um, you know, we have some great sponsors there and we are going to definitely have a conversation between Kelly Jensen of Book Riot and, uh, John Tresta. So I know some of you in the room will be in attendance. We'll be looking forward to seeing you and, um, come prepared to network and meet more trustees. I missed what you're referring to. The Lacona Trustee Banquet. It's on Friday, May 3rd. Can you explain the, the acronym? Oh yeah. Lacona, well, it's. Technically, we're just Lacona now, but <laughs> in its origination, when it started, I don't think it was directly in 1954, but it was a little, 1954 is when the organization got started in the Oak Park area. Um, it was the Library Administrators Conference of Northern Illinois. So we do a, now in our current iteration, um, libraries pay a flat membership fee, and we do a bunch of continuing education um, things for all levels of library workers, and we have different sections geared towards Circulation, um, I'm, the, I'm on the supervisors, the administrators, and managers section. Um, we have uh, programming and outreach one, tons of different stuff. On Friday the 3rd, they will also be doing an acquisitions event at Helen Plum in the morning. Um, we'll be at Reaching Forward as well, doing presentations and, but the trustee banquet was a big one pre-pandemic 2020, and then it died down a little bit, and now we're bringing it back in a different iteration. I guess as a trustee, I'm wondering why I haven't heard of it. You would have to ask your director about that. Because that's how it's advertised is to all library directors. So even at your previous library, if they remember, I, I know where you swore, um, they're members as well. Okay. You can check us out at lacone.org as well if you want to see what we got going on. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, okay. from Farmington, I've got good news, better news, and best news. The good news is, from my point, is I was re reappointed as a trustee. Better news is our parking lot is completed. We haven't started on our deck yet, but it's wonderful to have all this space to park. And the best news is returning to Bloomington Public Library after COVID and um, construction. We have our citywide reading program that's starting up again um, next month, and we're focusing on um, the Eastland disaster. Um, it's a ship that went down, and 800, I believe 844 lives were lost. It was a ship in Chicago in 1915. So it's going to start and have uh, corresponding books for um, all ages. So that's exciting after it's been gone for so long. That's great. Diane? Thanks. Okay, uh, if there are no other board member reports, uh, we'll recap. Um, our next board meeting will be held on Friday, May 24th uh, at 10 a.m. to allow some extra time for the holiday weekend. 
Um, we'll have a review of closed session minutes, approval of the APC grant, uh, Rail CE continuing education uh, and consulting program overview, and uh, board development review of the ebook data project. Anything else to add to the agenda for next month? All right. Uh, if not, we'll see you at 10 a.m. on May 24th. This meeting is adjourned at 2.49 p.m. Thank you for your time.